Thank you very much. I'm glad to see all of you. And those of you who know me well know that you do not have to take out pencil and paper as you would for a real lecturer. Um, I talk with Tremia and I talk with Chris and neither, although they are experts on their job, but neither knew exactly what I was supposed to do, what I am supposed to do. And you could say that um, if my dear friend, late friend, uh, Ron Jordan were here, he said, whatever it is, make it short. <laughs> but they gave me a certain time to do something, and so I'll try to do it. I thought maybe it would be kind of good for me to share with you some of my background to kind of give you an idea of why I do what I do. And I don't know whether that's okay. Is that okay, Dave? All right. <laughs> Dave Johnson was my doctor, although he was a medical doctor. He was also my psychiatrist, too. <laughs> along with the late Dr. Ellison, who was here. Um, I, um, I was born in Henderson, North Carolina, Vance County, one of the smallest counties in, in North Carolina, kind of a hotbed for the KKK. And it's kind of difficult for me to say what, when I started drawing, and I've shared this with many, many, uh, several of you, but I'll, for those people who haven't heard me run off at the mouth about what happened when I was a little boy, my mother says that um, I sat on her lap and I would draw in the air when I was about two, two and a half. And she said that the Older ladies now, I'm not being sexist, I'm just telling you the way it is, because I guess older men could care less about a kid riding in the air. But the older ladies said, Viola, that boy of yours is touched. <laughs> How many of you know what that means? <laughs> okay. It was later on that I asked my, I said, why would you let somebody say your son is half nuts? She said, well, they didn't know what they were talking about. Because I actually did that when I was in high school, too. But I did it, you know, sitting at my desk, and I would kind of draw. And when I was a kid, and librarians don't want to hear this, but it, it's unfortunate that the borders on most of my books had drawings in them. And we rented, when I was in elementary school, we rented our books. And at the end of the year, you, the teacher gave out erasers and you could erase, but she didn't give them to me because the books were so messed up with drawings that my parents just had to pay the fee for the books. Um, it was kind of a, anytime I had paper, I would draw. And unfortunately, that the kids here in Spotsylvania and Fredericksburg and Stafford and, and surrounding area, their vocabulary in art was greater than mine when I was a freshman at Virginia State College back in 1953. I didn't have a vocabulary. But my teachers encouraged me to draw. And my parents, who did not have a, a lot of formal education, uh, encouraged me, and, but, and provided, you know, paper. Every Christmas, I would get a watercolor set, and the watercolor set was used up by the time we went back to school in January. And so, I didn't have much in a way of training, and I didn't have, and I'll, I'll share that with you as I move on through high school and then get to college very briefly. Um, 
In high school, I did posters for the teachers. I learned to draw the skeleton and all of the bones, except for those tiny metacarpals and metatarsals, without looking in the book. The digestive system without looking in the book because I drew them so much. Each year, the, even though I wasn't taking biology I, at the time, I, I did it for the biology uh, teacher. And so I was known for being able to draw, uh, but not, not having any, any skill beyond, I guess you might say, well, maybe drawing skills that were a little above average. But I had that insatiable desire to draw. So I would, uh, in high school, you could get a pad of typing paper. Uh, Marguerite Young would remember that if she were here. Uh, about that thick for 25 cents. And I would go up to Alfred's on the main street in Henderson, that's Garnet Street and also Route 1. And I'd get that pad of paper and I would draw on it. Nothing earth shaking, but I would draw on it. And I would finish that stack of paper by Sunday evening. Uh, and I, I saved those drawings and I'll jump ahead for a moment. And my last count I had based on counting one section and getting 500 sheets, I had about 2,000 some drawings that my sister, her sophomore year in college, came home and was, and you know how sometimes people, women and, well, I'm gonna be hard on women a little bit tonight. <laughs> they get that desire to straighten out and clean. And so, mother, I'm gonna clean out his room. And she threw away that box. And we both sat on the bed and cried uh, when she did that. And I was probably too poor, but uh, Emery Walker would tell you that I cry very easily anyway, so it's not, a, not too much of a problem. But I, I tell people now to save your drawings, save what you do, because you never know. And you'll see a drawing that I had saved for, I know, the last 20 years, and what I did with that later on as, as we talk. Um, but when I was a senior, it was determined by me that I wanted to go to college and major in art. Did not ever have art taught. And my homeroom teacher, who was a former matron at Bennett College, was able to talk to the art instructor, one of the artists there at Bennett College, by the name of Macmillan. And she got Mr. Macmillan to come to Henderson and show about 15 of his paintings and presented it at our assembly. And I met him and I was in awe of all that he had done. Now if I jump ahead, and I hope you don't mind my scattering since you're not taking notes, 25 years later, Mr. Macmillan's wife is in my living room out in Spotsylvania buying a painting from me. So I said, it's, it's a small world. Um, but Mrs. Avent, whom I love dearly, she said, you will not be happy doing anything but your art. Now, I wanted to teach and I wanted to be a competent artist. But there were no teaching jobs in my hometown, my white counterpart, because the schools were not integrated, my white counterpart had to suffer too. A high school senior at Henderson High couldn't have art, didn't have it, because it wasn't provided. And so even though we, we felt very often that it was not separate but equal. In this case, it was equal in the sense that neither school had art education and none of the elementary schools. And it's so vital, and I'm, I, I guess I plug a little bit when I talk about the arts. It's so important. Now, my parents couldn't, I had students when I went to James Monroe and <laughs> showed the wing victory of Samothrace 
that's at the um, Louvre and also the Mona Lisa. And I had students say, Mr. Johnson, I just saw this last summer. I said, oh my goodness, you know. <laughs> it's just amazing uh, how economically speaking, uh, some things can be provided that will help to nurture certain things like an appreciation for the arts and so forth uh, based on uh, economics. So I took Ms. Avent's advice and I enrolled at Virginia State College in art education. It was a fine arts degree in art education where you heavy into methods and you end up having um, jewelry, create, uh, drawing, painting, an assortment of semesters of, of studio work. And I had in my little outline that I was going to tell you about a situation that was kind of funny for me because I didn't have an art vocabulary. So my freshman year in drawing class, I was asked to, uh, I was doing a, a little sculpture. She gave me some clay to work with and I was doing a little sculpture and I had this woman standing on a, on, a, on a hill. Now, since it was a sculpture, you can't say that I didn't put a bathing suit on, but anyway, <laughs> my, my art teacher said, Johnny, a woman's breast is not made like you. They're just not stuck on <laughs> like that. And so she, this, I hope you all understand this, because uh, I guess it's going on the computer, but I, it's just one of those things. <laughs> so she called me up to the front of the class. And she said, now, I want you to feel my breast. <laughs> feel it and see how this must feel right there. And somebody, some guy in the class said, go ahead, Johnny P. <laughs> I was so country and I was so embarrassed. She said, you see how that muscle runs all the way back there? They're not stuck on. That was really embarrassing. The next situation was the head of the department was teaching basic drawing. And she said, we want to do a gesture drawing. I didn't know what a gesture drawing was. So there was the model, and I was to do a gesture. She said, you have, I think, a minute to do this. And so we started the drawing. Everybody was moving. And time was up. I had an eye <laughs> on the paper after the minute, and Harold from New Jersey, who had gone to an all hot school, had scribbled. And she teacher came over, and you could say honey and touch somebody then. It was not sexual harassment. And she was kind of old anyway. <laughs> and she came over, and she touched me on the shoulder. She said, honey, that's not a gesture, John. Do you, you see what Harold has? And when I looked over there and I saw that little chicken scratch, so to speak, I said, I know I'm in the wrong place now. I've, I've just... <laughs> but it, it began to come but, uh, along with me. And I, I felt a little bit secure because they saw in some ways uh, I didn't have that touch to give you the drawings that, 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 that your high school and some of your uh, younger kids in school now have because they've been taught. Played basketball in college and it probably, and I, I wanted to be very honest in this lecture, probably I was more concerned about people seeing me as an athlete than seeing me as a fine arts major because there were things that they said about art majors, and I think you, you know, and so I, I had a problem. I have regretted it ever since that my attitude was that way, but that's the way I was brought up. Somebody was assisted because they acted a certain way, and I did not want that, but I, I say that, and I admit that because that's not the way I feel, and that's not the way I treated people 
who were who had lifestyles were different. I was always very sensitive to that, but I wanted people to see me as a as a as an athlete and not. So you didn't see me a whole lot with my portfolio or a sketch pad out on the campus. Probably would be a better artist now had I done that. But anyway, coming out of college and coming up to Fredericksburg to teach um, and meeting Jean has a lot to do with the kind of person that I am now and the artist in me that never feels that he is, has reached any... I, get, I tell you what happens in Fredericksburg. People can spoil you, but I think that I'm humbled enough to not, what, not take in what people say about me. And that's the countryness in me, because uh, everybody is somebody. But I have found out if you teach somebody's child and the children love you, then they love you. And so I have a, I've taught so many students I have a lot of people who love me, and sometimes they love me enough to say anything. <laughs> For example, I had a person who met me once I began to show other kinds of work other than just the representational. I had a lady come to me and she says, uh, Johnny, uh, now I don't know anything about art, but I think you are regressing. <laughs> I, I say it under my breath. I, I, I think, I think I understand that you don't know much about art. <laughs> the late Pete Hearn, I God bless, rest his soul. Pete told me, he said, Johnny, I don't think I'm going to buy any more paints from you until you go back to what you were doing in the late '60s. I said, Well, Pete, I'm not sure that you're going to be able to do that. Uh, but what happens? I wanted to talk to you from the standpoint of being an African-American, and I'll use the term black because I used it probably more than I've used African-American, but I want to tell you that I am very sensitive to, I don't carry the race on my shoulder, but I'm aware that there are certain expectations for some black artists, some performers, some artists, uh, visual artists and so forth. I have a concern, and I had it when I, I went to Howard. Some of my paintings dealing with social issues were paintings that you had to look at and then try to figure out what was being said. And so I had some people who were much younger to say to me, why don't you try to let the people know what you're talking about? I said, well, I don't feel that as an artist that I should think that black people are not intellectually sharp enough to look at something and then come up with their own view of something or their own way of interpreting it. But, uh, and so I've, 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 I've done that a lot. I did it a lot back in the late 60s and the 70s except, you know, the things that are obvious, like what I'm going to talk about, the mother and child, and I'll give you a little background on, on that. But getting here in Fredericksburg and getting settled, and I said Jean was a sobering experience, uh, influence in my life, and she, she really did. I don't know where I would be if it weren't for her be, becoming a part of my life, uh, because I was, I was, Concerned, but I, I could have been very reckless. <laughs> I think a lot of men in here could admit that. <laughs> um, I started painting watercolors because we were staying, after we were married, we were staying in an apartment, and I had oils and I had watercolors. And I loved, I loved the oils. I loved working with oils. But with my schedule, uh, two years after I got here, uh, they said the rationale was that if you played basketball in college, you'd be a good line coach on the football team. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how, how that happens, but it so happened that Walker Grant at that time had four men on the staff. 
And so I had to be the line coach. And Buddy Ham and Oliver Griffin and all, we had one of the biggest lines in the state of Virginia at that time and did pretty well. For those of you who don't know, who are not from Fredericksburg, Barker Grant, small school. We never had, when I was teaching there, we never had over 155 students in nine through 12, but we kicked some butt. <laughs> Bigger schools, we really kicked them. I see Norcom, Booker T of Suffolk, we, 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 Hoffman, Boston, all the schools we played, I, maybe with one exception, maybe there aren't any exceptions, all the schools we played were larger. But then they use the rationale, Johnny, you get along well with people, and so you will make a good administrator. I said, but I'm not interested. Well, just think about this. When you retire, I said, you know, 60 years from now, I'm not thinking about retirement. So they made me assistant principal over at Walker Grant and took away some of the classes that I was teaching and then I still had the art. But my time was tied up. So watercolor was something I could do when I got back home. When, when you're a line coach, you are the flunky, especially in a small school because all the injuries you have to take to Mary Washington and Dr. Harrington, he won't, make, won't admit it, but we have to make him here in this town. He was the only um, orthopedic surgeon. And so when I had two things, who is this doctor, John? Dr. Ellison. Who do you want to call? I said, Dr. Ellison's going to tell me to call Baldwin Harrington. So that's what we did. And I got home late, ended up with an ulcer, and that's another story. But... Let me tell you what my first exhibit in Fredericksburg was at the community center. And I did, uh, after Shelton was born, I guess I was the dumbest and proudest father in the world. Um, the lady told me up at the hospital, you know, Ms. Johnson, you can't be here. And I said, it's my baby. I can take pictures of my baby. No, you can't be in here. I said, okay, thank you. But anyway... Shelton would reach for me, at, he would say, take daddy, when I would come up the steps at our apartment. And I did a painting of, that was a homage to all fathers with him, I'm reaching down for him. And I, somebody told me, he said, you ought to show that to the community. I said, it's too sentimental. And uh, they said, well, I think I would do it. So I, I put my little ladder strips around the canvas, took it up to the community center. And as I was signing in, a woman came in and she saw the painting and began to shed tears. She said, who in the world did this? Well, it was something that meant a lot to me, but it was not what you might say artists would normally show in competition and so forth. But it's one that... Um, Hopefully, Jean will pass it on to Shelton if she survives me uh, after she moves off to scene or before. Anyway, I started showing. It gave me a little bit of courage. And I showed in the St. George's Episcopal Church had a religious art festival. And I showed, in my notes I say, I showed at that festival and I had, they believe it or not, a Presbyterian minister bought the painting called Faith. It was done on, on plywood and oils. And then I had another one with the manger scene and the a cross. I used sand and sawdust with that, the manger scene. And then I had a, a cross in the background, and I called that the gift. And that's so. So I had about three hundred and fifty dollars, and boy, I tell you, that was I was smoking there. I mean, that was something. <laughs> that was money. That was money. But and so I, I I started started to show in the area. There were very few um, artists in town. There weren't any black artists that I knew, and. Mr. Best, I think it is, 
mention at the uh, dinner today we had that th the town is just, he talked about how, how art is here and how much emphasis is placed on it and so forth. I think that was the gist of what he said. And I said, you know, 50 years ago, you could count the artists, you know. Now you go into places and you see art and you have people who have come down from other places in the, on the East Coast or from the West Coast even. And so it has become a town that has favored, uh, that, that's a favorable place for artists. And I know I, I have been blessed. <coughs> Um, now, how did you come about, come up with, with these? I'm going to ask them to turn this off now, and I want to tell you something about each one of these paintings. <clears throat> and you might have to turn your head, <clears throat> because I have a little, uh, a little something about each one. Uh, when I talked with um, Ellen regarding Kilo uh, about <clears throat> what I was going to, how I was going to do it, um, these are social commentaries. I've had students to ask me, white students, Mr. Johnson, do you have any flesh tone? And uh, invariably I would give them a tube of black paint. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, then, then I would have to tell them, I said, now, wait a minute, now, you look at, you look at Marie, you look at Joan, and you look, all three are white, but look at their complexion. It's different. And so, and they, then they would get it, because I like, I don't like to just overwhelm them with racial things, but any time I could mention something that might make all students stop and realize that Basically, for example, when I do a black mother and child, there are quite a few white people who have black mother and child paintings in their, in their homes. And, but I had someone to tell me, said, white people are not going to buy that. I said, well, the feeling that a white mother has about a baby is no different from a black mother or a Jewish mother or a Hispanic mother or a Muslim mother. It's, it's, it's there. You know, when you talk about love, love is, is, is colorblind. And so that has not stopped me from doing things. My wife, in spite of 52 years of living with a fairly decent human being, <laughs> invariably sticks her head out of the door at, at home where I've used the family room as a studio for the last 20 years. And she says, who are you doing that for? I said, Jean, I'm doing it for me. Because she still has not gotten used to the idea that I love art and I love to paint and I'm painting at home instead of the studio so I can be close to you, dear. <laughs> I'm hoping that she'll, she'll see that. <laughs> but now let's start with the paintings. The, if you can look back at the I'm somebody, uh, it's a little girl who's about the age of my granddaughter. And you see she has a little patch on her skirt. I was hoping that that might be enough to suggest that she is economically not well off. And, but she is an African American. And there are two things that, um, uh, that might be held against her. She's poor and she's black. Well, three things, and she's female. And, but the title is, I'm Somebody. I had a black student who finished Howard University from James Monroe, and then went down to Duke and had an opportunity to get a fellowship at Duke to work in Atlanta and her boss was a white man who came to her and told her, said, now, I'm your supervisor, and I want to tell you, you already have two strikes against you based on my upbringing. You're black and you're female. 
Two months later, at the end of the year, he called in the office and said, I have never had anyone to be an intern to measure up to what you've done. She said, Mr. Johnson, I was just determined to prove to him that I'm somebody. And she did. The little boy I saw in the, you, if you turn first, then you, your next can be back in place later on. <laughs> and I thought about what had happened in Prince George's County, but throughout the country, you know, I've been concerned about black on black crime and also the proliferation of, of guns. And so I have some toy guns down on the ground. And if the little boy were asked, what are you going to be when you grow up? Uh, he might retort, if I grow up, because of the drive-by shootings. I think it was after five of those people were killed in Prince George's County, and one was under 10, drive-by shooting. Um, jamming, uh, we say that jazz is one of the fine arts that we've given to world culture. And blacks had a lot to do with that. And so I use uh, the music, uh, the motif of New Orleans is one of my favorite places to go to. And uh, I've sketched musicians there. I tried to sketch musicians in Preservation Hall. And when I went in, the man said, you can't sketch in here, but you can take pictures. <laughs> I, I didn't quite understand that. And so I had the camera, and I, would, I took pictures of some of the musicians, and I've worked from, from some of them. But I didn't understand that, uh, because I have, holding the sketch pad in your hand is much easier than having a a camera without a flash, of course, uh, pointed in your face. Because if you're in Preservation Hall, you're about six feet from the people. That's all. It's just they jam you in there, and you're sitting low. So not the most comfortable, but excellent music. The blues, you don't think necessarily about W.C. Handy, but black people and I guess all people, but black people especially, have come up with, with expressing um, heartache, joy, and, and many other nuances of feelings, emotions that we can have through the singing of the blues and the writing of the blues and so forth. And so that's why I use uh, the image called the blues singer. And Celebration was a fun painting. Um, Paul Muick at Mary Washington uh, left me with about 16 paintings. And I said, Paul, I'm going to have to, I, we bought the place and I'm going to have to do, he said, Johnny, just cut the canvases up, give them to somebody, and you use the um, stretchers. And I did that. And I wanted the freedom. And so that painting, uh, expresses a lot of joy as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the faces are almost non-existent and I'm, I'm hoping I have a strong movement uh, that's kind of a semi-curve going up in the canvas. Um, but I enjoyed doing it because it was just sweeping the brush across. And of course, you can think that red is one of my favorite colors. Larry would agree, wouldn't you? <laughs> now, coming on around, I have to look at it myself because sometimes, oh, nobody knows the trouble. Now, those of you who know about Negro spirituals, you know that nobody knows the trouble I see, nobody knows my sorrow, and nobody knows but Jesus. And it's a man that's just contemplating life. 
You could, you could name it the thinker. You could name it a pause in the day or whatever. Um, that was it. That was what I tried to show there. Uh, in spite of the colors, uh, I'm not sure that you, you get happiness out of that. I'm hoping that it's, it's a, a feeling between happiness and despair and so forth. Uh, and the next one, the unconditional love, uh, is a favorite subject of mine. I was very close to my mother and I just feel that she has, was just, just tremendous. And so the feeling that when I was a boy, we had a black pharmacist named Dr. Douglas. And you would, uh, Dr. Douglas had a drugstore that had a fountain and we would go and get malts from him, uh, from Dr. Douglas. And the women, the farmers would come in uh, to sell tobacco and many of them used their wagons to bring, we're talking about in the uh, late 40s, mid to late 40s after the war. And the women would sit in Dr. Douglas's uh, place. I don't know how he managed because most of them weren't buying stuff, but they would take out their breasts and nurse their babies. And it was no big deal. I mean, I, you know, and I was, I was just not sensitive to how beautiful that was. Later on, I began to realize that bond between the mother and the child and that love. I mean, you, and I don't care how poor you are, if, if you see a mother interacting with a baby, it, it, it is something else. It, for me, I still, I still love that. Um, and the family, in spite of the fact that uh, there are many single parent families in this country. Some, unfortunately, because the man has left the scene, and sometimes there's a death of the mother, death of the father. But um, I'm thinking that if, if possible, <laughs> having a family, <laughs> it does so much. And I wanted to show the closeness of the family. Now you notice, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the texture later, that most of these paintings have a lot of texture. Now I'll tell you when I show these, once we get through all of these, I'll tell you about that. It's, it's, I can't really explain why I use it, but I, I just enjoy using a lot of texture. In this one, uh, we're going to have class now. What do you see in this particular painting? Can anybody just say? Do you see any symbol up there, Neil? At first, I just saw a young man in, in pushing ahead, but I also see a wound on the side there now, too. Well, do you see anything else? Scales? There's the scale of justice. Mm -hmm. And I call it the constant struggle. The constant struggle. It could be blood. I don't know. That, you know, sometimes things, people see things in the painting that I didn't intend. But uh, that is one that I started doing years ago. Sometimes the struggle was with nature. But the whole idea was no matter what happens, for everybody, mostly, life is a, it kind of a struggle. But for... African Americans in this country, in spite of the progress that has been made, it is still a struggle. And in this particular painting, uh, was one of Paul Muick's uh, gimmies, and I stretched this, and I wanted to paint something on it, and I wanted to paint rising above. And you, if you don't see the lynching situation here and the KKK here and the burning cross that's almost faded out. I put that in and the title Rising Above because many of the people early in the early part of last century, uh, even after, you know, when I was in my teens, 
um, had to rise above the hatred that was there and the constant uh, humiliation in some cases. And uh, here I wanted to express they're not giving high fives, but they're reaching up and they're rising above uh, what is there. And I use the cotton field. Um, my first bicycle, my only bicycle I had, my uncle gave me, I planted an acre of pot cotton for him by myself. And he gave me a bicycle at Christmas time, and that was the only one that I had throughout high school. He gave his sons bicycles, and he used to compare them with me. He said, he, they've gone through three bicycles, and I still had the one, the original one he gave. Now, several people commented on this one because that was in keeping. This was shown at Mary Washington uh, in the late Sam Emery, really loved the little series that I was doing, and he commented on it, but it was uh, shown over there in the department, and uh, education department, and it's called, I've Been There and I'm Tired. And this is the situation where an individual has done all of the things, all of the right things that society says you should do, and still, it's not enough. And so you go to him or her and say, come on, we want you to go down and uh, to the forum on such and such. She said, no, I've been there and I'm tired. And I think many of the African Americans in here and maybe sometimes white people have, have gotten tired of doing all of the so-called right things to no avail. And uh, that's one I still have hanging. On the other hand, the I will work for food is something that is really uh, obvious in our day. We see these signs. And sometimes I see signs that I wonder if they're thinking before they put them on there. I have a sign of one of the gentlemen out near the mall. And no matter what time of day you go by, it means I am plain hungry. Has anybody in here seen that? You've seen it. And I, I gave him $5 the other day, and I know, and the reason it came to $5 is that usually it's a couple of dollars, but I've passed when I'm not close enough to him to give him the $1 or $2. And if he was still hungry that afternoon, it meant that he was too lazy to walk to McDonald's or wherever it is to get the food. <laughs> But it is something that I've been very sensitive about and feel really guilty about passing people whom I feel are in need. It's something about what my beliefs are and what God wants us to do. I feel very strongly. Uh, and I know that sometimes you might be used, but I, I, feel I have some strong feelings about passing by people who are in need. Uh, that's a sign of the times. The skeptics is one that I, I did probably in the late 60s first. And in our society, you have the skeptics. And sometimes it can be a very positive thing, so you don't get the wool pulled over your face. But other times, you can pass up some opportunities because you're too skeptical. You know, if the white person is doing it for the black person, I'm skeptical about motives. And you, you can't tell me there aren't good white people. You can't tell me there aren't good black people. So skepticism is something that is a commentary. And you'd have to think about what you do. And, and uh, there are people probably in your experience who have been that way and some have made progress because they made the right decisions and others are still in the position they are in because they didn't take advantage of something based on who was doing the giving. Moving on down, the painting called Faith is one that my mother posed for 
40 years ago. John Patrick was three years old. I said, Mom, um, if you pose for this painting with John Patrick, I'll give you, uh, um, I think, 20%, 25% of what, what I make on it. And it was a canvas. And um, I, she posed for it, and I did it in oils. And I took it to rest in Virginia, and they, um, I sold it. No, not, not rest, and I took it up to North Stamford, Connecticut, up near Howard Cosell and Jackie Robinson's home, so you know there was money in that area. <laughs> IBM employee bought it, and I guess 10 years later she called me. She paid $300 for it, and that was a lot of money. And um, I gave Mama the, the, her $30. She said, oh, that's the most I've made in such a but, but anyway, <laughs> for that little bit, because she couldn't, she couldn't stay still long enough anyway. And John Patrick, you know, if you know, he didn't stay still long. But um, I, there's a child next to her, next to him over there. But my mother had a strong faith, and uh, she quoted scriptures that I didn't know I, I had heard them most of my life from her, and now that I'm more involved in the church, I'm finding out that she was right on target. In fact, Mrs. Davies, she always quoted the one that was in church Sunday about uh, uh, whither thou goest, I will go, and so forth, and Ruth, in the book of Ruth. Um, so I guess within the last... 15 years, the lady who owns that painting called me and said, Johnny, um, we're divorced now and I'm on hard times and I had somebody to come over and estimate the cost of painting. I want to know if you want to get it back. I said, well, how much is it? She said, it'll be 18 to $2,000, $1,800, $1,800 to $2,000. I said, well, I'm sorry, Joyce, I won't be. <laughs> much, as, much as I love mama, I'm not, I can't do that. And then the last one, getting there, I think I'm doing it right. Is that right, Tremia? Yeah, getting there. And you see that there are some hands that are raised, and I tried to show that they are from different racial groups and so forth. And um, I, think, I think we're getting there. I think we're, I'm, I'm seeing more, more interaction. Now, but I want to talk to you, I got about seven or eight more minutes. I want to be able to show these uh, few things, and then you may ask questions if you wish. Um, Tamia, are you going to, please? Now. Reverend Davies knows that song, There's a Bright Side Somewhere. And that's, that's the title of the painting that I, it was a demonstration piece that I've been doing. This shows that early on, Jean was one of my favorite subjects and it's all done with a painting knife, that particular one, because initially, you know, I like Van Gogh's work, he worked very, Thorough, but more recent uh, within the last century was Hans Hoffmann, very thick canvases. Now, the painting that's on your left and then it's highlighted, the painting is one that it took me almost 20 years to get out of my living room because Jean liked it so much. <laughs> I told her, I said, Jean, it's okay. It's called The Awakening, but it was an experimental painting. It had no, what I told her, no soul, no, no real feeling. But why I wanted to be shown is to show you that those two um, areas, the areas, the heavy texture is polymer medium put in a plastic container because I finished varnishing something <clears throat> and didn't cover it. 
left it and it dried up. And I just peeled it out. And I said, shoot, I can use this as texture. And I, <laughs> I, I want you all to look forward to seeing a series of paintings that I'm doing called Homage to Okra. And what I'm using is the vegetable okra in these paintings. And it's all textured, the stems of the okra, the okra, the seeds of the okra, and the dried. I have two drawers of dried okra at the studio. And I've already begun uh, painting on, on one of them. But anyway, that was texture, and that was done at least 40 years, over 40 years ago. And I have it hanging in the studio. I don't want to sell it, uh, but I didn't want to look at it every day at home like Jesus. <laughs> there you see a, pa a painting called The Man, and you see how thick it is. This man, is, his face shows nothing but turmoil. And I've had that for about 45 years. And the reason I'm showing you this, um, Reverend Davies knows I have a warped sense of humor, but this is a person he knows, I won't mention it, until, I'll tell him about it later, had a member of our church who, she and her husband moved out of town, and she came to our home on Charles Street, and they were on the stairway on the wall, and as she went down, there were three paintings. The man was one of them. And she took two off the wall and walked to her car. They were going back to Maryland, and I walked out behind her, thinking that she was going to give the paintings back. She got in the car, <laughs> and she said, Johnny P., you always said you were going to give me a painting, <laughs> so I have mine now. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> so they just drove on up Charles Street. I don't want anybody else in here to try that. <laughs> but the man is, is in my studio at home. Now, I don't know if you can see this or not, but I, for those people whom I have told they should work from sketches no matter how old. In this one, the man figure on the right head is bowed, and it is a homeless person. And now, the painting, and uh, Chris, if you want to set it up now, the painting that I did, I call it, there is a bright side somewhere. I raised the head, and that's the sketch that I raised, and right there is the masonite that I worked on, and the gesso that I put on the masonite before I put the fiber paste. And Chris, that, that is the painting. And the, because I wanted to show that the man doesn't look overwhelmingly happy, but he doesn't look sad. And he is looking up and not down. Okay, now, I don't know that I've missed what I wanted to say. It's not a typical lecture, and I, I try not to ramble too much. And I'm now open for questions. I think I've given Gene plugs. <laughs> oh, I do want to tell you, the artist that I studied under at Howard was from Ethiopia, and he was called Skunda Bogasin. Skunda was internationally known, and I think the Corcoran and Howard, within the last month and a half, have recognized him. But I would take my textured paintings up, and Skunda would go to them and, what is this, Johnny? He, you know, I, he's from Africa, and you know, he had a lot of symbolism in his work. But I probably had far more texture than he did, but he had some very interesting things. And I don't touch him as far as the, 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 the type of work. But Skunda Bogas, I wanted to share that with you. But he was recently uh, the young man who did the jubilation sculpture. 
was a student of mine at James Monroe, and he told me about Skunda being honored because he was at Howard at the time. Um, my medium now is mostly acrylics. I'm going to be working with some oils, but there'll be alkits that dry to the touch in about 18 hours. And so I'm going to do those. But Gene, I won't do them at home because they'll smell up the house. Um, but sometimes uh, the expectations for black artists is everything that he or she does ought to be directed toward blacks. Oh, I had two paintings I didn't talk about there in the hall. One was the grandfather's love, granddaddy's love, and I, I, I have a love for my grandchildren like that. Another one is, as you go out, you'll see it. It's called Sage Advice. And I made the man not look like a college professor or, or you know, well-educated because I believe that some of the sage advice that I received in my community, in my neighborhood, uh, was given by people who, if they were able to read and write, it was on a limited basis. And I loved them dearly, and I took their advice seriously. I had a couple of ladies to give me 50 cents a piece and told me to keep your hands in God's hand and don't stray from what your mother has taught you. And that was my graduation present. So I kind of have leaned toward reaching out to people who just needed a little bit of a boost because self-esteem, I think, is so important. But that's it. <laughs>